if a child comes up to you and starts talking to you about having some dark thoughts, a parent is going to be terrified. I would be. And so you have to, you have to kind of, you know, almost have to put like poker face on and say, tell me more. September marks Suicide Prevention Awareness Month. We bring you insight into a complex issue and how you can help. Montana and Wyoming, both states filled with natural beauty, rugged history, and good people. But we also share a commonality that doesn't make us so proud. Per capita, our two states rank first and third for deaths by suicide. In both states, suicide is the second leading cause of death for people ages 10 to 44. And though the why may be hard to understand, what you need to know is that three simple words can help save lives. Nobody really wants to die. People want the pain to stop. The most important message Dr. Eric Arzubi, a child and adult psychiatrist, wants the world to understand about suicide. It's not that people don't want to don't want to live. They a lot of them feel like they've exhausted every possible way of getting closer to having peace of mind, slowing down the thoughts that are sort of distressing and upsetting can't find relief, don't know how to find relief, and ultimately feel, feel trapped. The reasons run deep. Childhood trauma, loss, genetics, isolation, risk factors, and mental health issues come from every direction and moment in life. Data shows while 12 million Americans have serious thoughts about suicide, nearly 48,000 complete it each year. And 2020 data reveals nearly 69% of Wyoming communities do not have enough mental health providers to serve residents. In Montana, that number jumps to 88%. I hope that um, at least what we're trying to do is try to make make it really easy to access mental health care, um, no matter where people are in Montana. Frontier psychiatry reaches beyond miles and borders and brings patients face to face with mental health experts in rural hospitals all across the state. Too often it's really difficult either because the resources aren't there, uh, people aren't around, you know, there's a long wait list. If you're concerned about a friend, family member or colleague, encourage them to seek professional help, whether that's texting, calling or physically helping them reach that safety. But often, even before that step, help can begin with conversation. Don't just ask them open-ended questions when you're talking with them. Don't say, you know, oh, you're doing okay, right? Megan Saunders knows suicide firsthand and now helps others cope with the loss and learn the tools. And it might be scary and that's okay, but just let them use their voice and tell you what's going on with them because I think for so many people struggling with any sort of mental illness, all they want is a space to be heard and connected to. And what, what happens, understandably so, is that, that a parent will respond and say, no, don't do that. You shouldn't do that. Your life, your, your life is fine. Isn't your life fine? And what that, that closes the conversation right away versus saying, tell me more, right? And by saying, tell me more, it opens up the conversation. Now, inside, I get, we want to say, no, don't kill yourself, that's a bad idea, I'd stop it. But that's not necessarily what the person needs to hear at that moment. What they hear, need to hear at that point is acceptance and, and, and empathy and curiosity. Tell me more. Three words that could help save lives. Suicide prevention is just one piece of the puzzle surrounding suicidal behavior. Now, every year, nearly 48,000 people complete suicide. That loss starts a ripple effect that spreads throughout families, friends, and communities, adding about 285,000 suicide loss survivors. The impact, leaving most, if not all of them, wondering what they could have done differently and if they can or will ever move forward. For me, the biggest thing is it's a little bit of kind of forced mindfulness. I can't come in here and start playing with a ball of clay and be thinking about, you know, bad things that happen in my week. I really just kind of have to be in the moment and focus on my clay and connect with that clay. Simplicity. It's what Megan Saunders says helps her survive suicide loss. A needed simplicity as this licensed pharmacist deals with day-to-day -day work and life, but more importantly, needed to cope and escape 
vivid memories. I essentially ended up going to his apartment and ended up letting myself in. Uh, when I first saw him, I still had that thought of like, oh, there's something that I can help with right now. And it took me getting across the room and actually touching him to realize that that just wasn't the case. I don't think I'll ever forget. It's, it's just kind of something burned into my, my brain, I guess, at this point. Burned into her brain, her father, 58-year-old David Michael Saunders, had taken his own life. Her dad, who just one year before had moved from California to Montana to start over. I was so excited to have him here. Oh, oh this is a fresh start. We're going to be healthy. We're going to make good choices. You know, I'm just going to support him and just help him be, you know, the best version of himself that he can be. It's, you know, carving pumpkins for Halloween and of him helping decorate the house. And um, we just had, so I had just so much hope um, that he was going to do really well after he moved out here and started living with me. Although bliss in the beginning, as months passed, Megan's already little house seemed to get even smaller. And her frustration with some of her father's choices grew larger. David eventually moved into his own place. And then life got busy. You know how it is, you blink and it's been a couple of weeks and you haven't talked on the phone or seen him in person. Megan describes their last two interactions as brief, a bit curt. It was just two days before Christmas when she realized that her dad hadn't responded to her text messages in over a week. It was then she went to his home. It was after that that she started to analyze and pick apart every interaction they'd had over the last year. You know, I, I wrestled with that guilt. Um, I still wrestle with it. It's been almost four years and I, it, when I have a bad day, there's that little voice in the back of my head, um, you know, saying, you should have, you could have. I, I remember, vividly remember that I physically felt like I had a hole in my chest. Such deep, deep sadness. Since that day, Megan has done a lot of work to move away from that dark place. You know, suicide loss kind of impacts the way that you understand that the world functions. It kind of shatters your view of, of you know, what is fair and what is right in life and how you picture life working out. Not only professional help, but she surrounded herself with others surviving similar pain. It's important to have people who've been where you've been and you know, are still struggling, but we are moving forward because I think that's all you can hope for a lot of the time is just, you know, what's my next step? She's now a facilitator for the Survivors of Suicide Loss Support Group in Billings so she can recognize and help others take their first steps. I think I maybe, maybe like the occasional power walk, um, but, you know, certainly not running certainly not jogging, occasionally trip and fall down, but, you know, recognize that it's okay to trip and fall down sometimes because that's going to happen for the rest of my life, and I know that, um, but just being able to get back up and... She's also taken part in suicide prevention education and trainings, the risk factors, signs, and knowledge she feels everyone should learn, but at the same time, understand. As a survivor, you can't bear that burden. You can do everything exactly right. You can check all of the boxes. You can, you know, take somebody out of a toxic situation and try to build this like perfect, wonderful life for them and address all of the things that you, all of the needs that you think they have that aren't met. And that still might not be enough. And that doesn't mean that we failed. That doesn't mean that that person is beyond helping. It just means that something happened to them that we just aren't able to fix one of many difficult concepts to comprehend surrounding suicide, which brings Megan back to simplicity and shaping her path moving forward. You know, if something goes wrong, you just smash the clay and, you know, you can wedge it a little bit and then start over again. That's okay that not everything is going to turn out how I think it's going to, you know, um, and that that's okay because I can try again tomorrow. There's always more clay. <laughs> if you or someone else is in crisis, text TALK to 741741 or call 1-800-273-8255. Q2 teams up with the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention for the Yellowstone Valley Out of the Darkness Walk. 
everyone is welcome at this annual event. The more people educated about suicide prevention and loss, the better we can help our communities fight it and heal. Now, Megan Saunders, who you just met, tells us how her first walk changed her life. I don't remember how I heard about it even or how I ended up there, but I just kind of showed up and said, you know, I want to do this and I want to register. Um, found out that registration was free, which is great. And then kind of started to, you know, figure out the walk. When you arrive, there's tents set up and you can go through and get beads that represent your different connections to suicide loss. You can get a bead if you've personally struggled with suicidal thoughts. You can get uh, beads if you've lost, you know, a sibling or a certain family member or a friend or a first responder or a parent. And for me, that first walk was so impactful because I went through the line and I got my beads and the beads for losing a parent to suicide are gold. And so I had my beads on and I was just kind of, you know, walking around the walk, not really talking to anybody because I didn't know anyone there. But I looked around the crowd and I saw maybe three other people, four other people that had gold beads on. And just kind of in that moment, without even speaking to those people or interacting, for me it was really helpful to just realize that like I'm not the only person who has gone through this loss because that's how it feels with suicide. I think for everybody who's gone through it, you feel so alone and you don't realize that there is this community, this huge community that's been through the same things that you're going through. If you or someone else is in crisis, text TALK to 741741 or call 1-800-273-8255. Well, Janelle, very informative and in-depth stories there. Uh, Montana and Wyoming continue to rank near the top when it comes to suicide per capita. Was there anything that really stood out to you and, and surprised you when you were doing this series? Well, all of the statistics and the information is surprising because it's so rampant in our communities. Um, but 90% of all people who commit suicide have a diagnosable mental issue at the time of their death. That's 90% and many of them are never diagnosed. Mm -hmm. And I guess that's when uh, the importance of being able to talk about it really comes in and events like we had this weekend with uh, the Out of the Darkness Walk, which raises awareness. It is so important, just learning some of the risk factors, the signs, some of the symptoms surrounding suicide prevention or surrounding suicide just talking about it, openly talking about it, and learning how to talk to someone about it if they're ha in crisis at that time. Yeah, it's tough to do. It is. But it can make a, an incredible difference. It could save a life. Yes, it could. Right. Thank you, Janelle. Thanks, Russ.